Homeless in my neighborhood want a lot more than spare change. Two whole years ago my wife Angie and I decided it was finally time to buy a house. We knew it was anything but a buyer's market, but we were sick of paying triple what a mortgage would be in rent every month. I'm sure this story is familiar to some of you and we went through every stage of disbelief, anger and finally apathy after every competitive offer we put together was blown out of the water by a multinational investment corporation. I'm not mad about the process anymore although it left me questioning where society was headed. How is this legal? I went to school. I paid off debt. I got a good job. I did everything right to still get priced out the fucking city I grew up in. Perhaps some anger remains. But after setting our sights on the city's less desirable neighborhoods we finally got our home. On June 1st we moved into a 4,500 square foot colonial. It had hardwood floors that patinated like leather and the frosted plaster trim gave the ceilings the look of a wedding cake. The basement was a different story. It wasn't just unfinished, it was a dank hole in the ground and scribbled on the walls were strange spirals and crude faces. Kids, the realtor had said like she knew who drew the markings. Fixing up the basement would be quite the value builder. So, sure, the kitchen had composite counters and the basement needed a sign above the entrance that read, Abandon all hope ye who enter here but we had a home and a damn big one at that. The catch was that it was a stone's throw from the freeway and that the area was known for its crime more than anything else. Angie said it was just a stepping stone, we'd bank a year's worth of mortgage, hope the housing market keeps rocketing and move again in a year. There were some flaws in her plan, mainly money, but I didn't say anything. I figured we'd both adjust to like it there. The first few weeks went smooth and me and the wife got to unpacking and introducing ourselves to the neighbors. Maybe it was the threat of crime and that there was comfort and purpose in knowing who you lived next to, but whatever it was our neighbors were incredibly friendly. We felt at home quick and while there were some shocks, we made games out of them to take the fear away. With the pops that permeated the night we had the game where we guessed whether the sound was fireworks or gunshots. When we passed large turds one of us would point and we played, human or dog. Unfortunately, after just a couple weeks at this game we became experts at differentiating between these. Gunshots carry the sharp crack of the sound barrier being broken while fireworks go boom or pop. As for the poop let's just say that we hadn't seen any dogs large enough to lay landmines around town. There was a homeless problem there for sure, but they minded their own business. Our neighbors seemed to see right through them. They'd act as if they were ghosts, like they weren't even there. Hell, everyone did. I'd smile and say hello in passing. The least I could do was treat them like human beings. One night after a movie I was at the sink washing the popcorn bowl. The window above looks out to our backyard which was heavily wooded for a city lot. When it was dark out, I could only see a sliver of what was outside beyond the reflection of myself in the glass. I frowned at the shadow of a tall dark stump. I don't remember a tree there. I swayed on my feet to see past my reflection. In between the bushes, nearly out of sight, a man was standing still, staring back at me. My heart leaped and I dropped the bowl where it crashed in the sink. You okay in there, honey? Angie shouted from the living room. Yeah. I kept my eyes on the man and said nothing to Angie not wanting to alarm her. I'm gonna take the trash out. Okay. I walked by the trash without touching it and opened the back door. Hello. Outside the wind was blowing hard and the branches of the buckthorn the man stood behind were waving wildly as if to warn me. What do you want? I stepped forward to try and show I wasn't scared but it was the tepid step of prey like I was better planting my weight to run. The man said nothing. I took another step forward more confidently this time but jumped when my movement activated the motion light. I composed myself and yelled, This is private property. If you don't leave I'm calling the police. Now this was the emptiest of threats and everybody in the neighborhood knew it. The cops made a point to show up an hour late if at all. The man walked forward a few paces to where I could see him better. He was very tall and wore a heavy wool overcoat that stretched all the way to his ankles. He kept walking towards me, my brain was shouting but I froze in fear. What do you want? He stopped just in front of me. A white scar starred across his black skin just below the chin. He was at least six foot six but the coat that ran the entire length of his body made him gigantic. His face was recently shaven and gaunt. He held out his fist at arm's length and when he uncurled his fingers, cupped in his enormous palm was a pill. I don't have any drugs, I said. His face didn't change any. There was no one or question in his eyes. You want me to take it? I pointed at his hand but still his expression was static. I reached out and gently plucked the pill from his palm. I held it between my forefinger and thumb. It was just a pill capsule, whatever had been inside had been emptied. What do you want? I asked again. He opened his mouth revealing the severed stump of a tongue and then he widened the enormous whites of his eyes. He began to mouth something but being tongueless I couldn't tell what. But my blood cooled because I felt certain it was some kind of curse. Please, I murmured. Please leave. He turned and stepped into the night and I watched the bushes sway in his wake as if he were a giant parting his way through the woods. The next day was set and I was determined to find out if anyone knew about this tall man. I walked to the strip mall and asked some of the homeless in the area, but as soon as I began to describe him, they all looked at the ground and shook their heads. The pattern was repeated with every other homeless person I tried to talk to. On my way home, I stopped by two men working on a car at the end of a driveway. Hey, I started over to them. This may sound a little crazy, but do you know of a tall fella around here that wears a giant coat? They both started laughing. Sorry to waste your time. I turned to go. No, no. One of them was waving me back. He talking about a really big motherfucker. The man raised his hand to signify. Yeah hi. Black coat. Nasty scars. Yeah. I nodded. Well, that's tall Frank. What you want about him? You see him and you're recycling. No, why? Tall Frank's a good man. He makes his living that way. I nodded. He was acting weird in my backyard last night. Weird how? Was he just looking like his weird self? No. He was staring at me from outside. When I went out he tried to say something. Or mouth something. 
both of their brows rose. You saying that Tall Frank tried to communicate with you? Yeah, they both looked at each other. Tall Frank talks to nobody, and by talks I mean, communicating in any kind of way. He cut his own throat to never talk again. The other chimed in. That's just a rumor. Tall Frank showed up in this neighborhood 20 years ago. No one knows where he came from and the man can't tell you. Yeah, people put all kinds of legend to those scars. Some say it was dog that bit him. But I never seen no dog that'll slice your tongue out. If he doesn't communicate with anyone how come he has the name Tall Frank? Hmm, well that's what my mama would call him. He leaned closer to me. She used to tell me to watch my tongue or Tall Frank will take it. He chuckled to himself. What do you think he wanted with me? They both shrugged. No clue. Will you be sure to tell us when you find out? They bent back to their work and I thanked them and went on far less assured than when I'd first set out. The next several days there was no sign of Tall Frank, but I began to fall ill. It was a headache at first, but soon I had heart palpitations and body aches that I almost let take me to the emergency room. I assured myself that there was no such thing as curses. Why was I letting one strange encounter with a homeless man dominate my every thought? Angie was working late recently and when I had the house to myself at night, I would stand at the kitchen window and stare into the backyard. I was obsessed and it wasn't long before I saw him again. I was wrapped in a blanket filling the teapot at the sink when I saw him standing in the same place as before. I dropped the pot and ran to the back door. Hey, my head felt light and I was in that same kind of drunken state where your fear hardly speaks to you. I scampered through the backyard over to him. What do you want with me? Tall Frank was staring at me. He gestured with his scarred neck for me to follow. I looked down at my bare feet, but he was already walking. Hey, just leave us alone. I stepped cautiously after him. When I got past the bushes where I could see the alley I saw him standing near the trash cans. I ran after him. Phew, I don't ever want to see you back here again. With our difference in size and the blanket wrapped around my shoulders I'm sure I looked to him like some angry hobbit. He certainly didn't act intimated and I can't blame him. Tall Frank crossed the alley and sat on a crumbling retaining wall. He gently tapped the stone next to him for me to sit. I'm not fucking sitting. He reached into his breast pocket and paused before pulling out an envelope. Then he put the letter in his other hand and reached in again and pulled out another. Where are those? He extended the envelopes to me. His long arm nearly stretched the entire alley. I approached the letters cautiously snatching them and stepping back. What are these? I muttered already distracted. They had both been opened and I took the papers out of one of the envelopes. It was a handwritten letter on college ruled paper. All the ink was smeared like it had been dunked in water, but I could still read it albeit slowly. When I was done reading, I let my arm fall down to my side and stared at tall Frank in disbelief. Angie had a lover. I looked at the other envelope and hardly had to read it to figure it out. The letter had read, Atlantic Life Insurance. The policy had been opened in my name for a quarter of a million dollars. I stumbled over to the retaining wall and sat. The pills. I thought about the empty capsule he'd shown me that I tossed aside. It was my emergency albuterol. It had to be. A quick WebMD search showed that an overdose started with symptoms of headaches and heart palpations. Angie is trying to kill me. Suddenly I realized Tall Frank's arm was around me and he was patting my shoulder paternally. We sat there in silence for a long time. The things you can learn from people's recycling. I said. Tall Frank nodded and we watched the upstairs light turn on and my wife appeared in the window. She twisted something in her fingers and then tapped it into a mug. A minute later I heard the back door open. Honey are you out here? Angie called. I made you some tea. I guess the homeless around her don't always want change. Sometimes they might want to save your life. 